All right, here we go. Let, let me introduce my guest, Jeremiah Chechik, um, probably best known to most of you as the, uh, and I, I know you've heard this a million times, <laughs> director of Christmas Vacation. Uh, you also directed Benny and June. Uh, you do a lot of television work. You've been in advertising. You've done uh, holography. You, uh, you're a photographer. I'm pretty sure I missed a gazillion of things. So what, what did I miss, Jeremiah? <laughs> How much time person. do we have? <laughs> uh, you know, um, a member of the Writers Guild, so I write. Um, right. You know, have a production company of which uh, this <laughs> pandemic has been uh, both encouraging and uh, difficult, but um, uh, coming out of it in a very positive way. Right. So, uh, you know, a polymath. I'd like to. Yeah, that's guess. that's uh, and and of course and of course we are co-hosts on the future of photography every week. That's right. Yes. And you know, you know, here's um, my Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying that uh, you know, I wake up every day and I think to myself, what can I do today? <laughs> what can I create today that what didn't exist in the world yesterday? And th that kind of motivates me um through my day. That's a pretty good way to to get motivated. And you know, here's, here's my problem with you. Um, on this podcast, I see my role kind of to be like a sort of a stand-in for the audience. I would be the one to ask the questions that the audience would like asked. Um, okay. And uh, of course, like a lot of the questions would be around your best known work. And while I'm usually quite good with US pop culture, I didn't learn about Christmas Vacation until I was an adult. And well, when it was on German shame television, on you. Shame I, on I know, you. I know. When it was on German television, they showed it in the uh, German version, the dubbed version, which is like which kills everything. So I never really watched it. So we cannot talk about this, which <laughs> I think might, might be a, with me. There's might be a blessing. <laughs> yes. Anybody curious? You could just uh, Google <laughs> Christmas Vacation, the movie. I'm yes. sure you'll find more than one and less than a million. <laughs> so, so about it. instead, I have uh, I have uh, made a suggestion of a couple of topics that we could brush on, um, and one is and and that's uh, it, it. It is it's centered around Hollywood. Um, we have all seen The Mandalorian, which is this, uh, well, from a production point of view, this very interesting new approach where you would do a lot of the production on set. Like the, the whole backgrounds, everything is pretty much live on set with a big screen. Um, there is virtual stuff in there. And this whole, this whole topic of virtual production um, which is a new paradigm, right? It allows them to change sets like within seconds, and uh, and and the sheer fact that even the the whole lighting aspect of things is partially being taken over by the environment. The environment lights you as a as an actor, so there is like it it, it changes a lot of like the the dynamics in creating content. So it it is transformative and will be. Uh, increasingly so over the next few years as LED screens uh, become finer in terms of their um, pixel density, for right. lack of a better term, which is really how many light sources you can crush into a panel. And they're generally about a foot square and they... And you just click them together, together, right? You you make them into That's a big it. wall. Um, so so how far has this, this new paradigm, how far has this penetrated the production in Hollywood, um, beyond, it, beyond the Mandalorian? Um, well, this year, it, it has started to take hold. Um, it is both um, expensive and mm. inexpensive, depending on how you allocate it, how you treat it. Um, I was fortunate uh, in that, I mean, I know people who worked on the Mandalorian, so I had some um, kind of side view of it. And um, I know John Favreau and, and the, the work um, in that show is, I, I would say, arguably dazzling. Um, it serves the story. It serves the way they want to shoot it. And um, w what was exciting for me in finally seeing it was that it, it really does work in a seamless way. 
Uh, I had the opportunity early when they had just started shooting it um, because of my interest for my own uh, creative work uh, in studying um, Unreal Engine uh, for the time. And um, I was invited uh, to Epic, who, who are the company behind Unreal, um, to actually learn at their, at their lab here. Um, I, again, when I say learn, <laughs> it's it's like climbing Everest, and I'm on the climbing wall inside. So, 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 I, I, I under <laughs> so Unreal Engine is I, is the is the de facto standard in that whole uh, virtual production uh, game no, right I'm, now, isn't it? Um, yes, but that's not the I think the driving motivator here. All right. Um, I mean, we could break it up into several different varietals, which is getting rid of green screen, which nobody likes and nobody has liked over the last 50 years. So there's that. Uh -huh. There is interactive lighting on stage from the environment. And then there is the environmental creation, which of which um, Unreal Engine is a really strong leader in that world. There are many, you know, you, the tools are, are vast from ZBrush as a sculptural tool, from Cinema 4D, Octane Render, to kind of move these these things out. World Creator 3, of which I'm kind of deep into. Um, or World, World Creator 2, 3 is about to come out. Um, but Epic has really driven virtual production when they, they, were, they must have had an aha moment to see that what they can do. And I think it began with... Um, concerts, raw concerts specifically to create kind of big screens for light shows and, and being able to put effectively large scale television behind performers and make them interactive and so programmable. It's, it's like the good old rear projection, isn't it? Just in, a, in an uh, updated, more modernized way. Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, you could say it's also about the shift in process, you know, where you have uh, partial small uh, models that uh, expand greater to uh, a set virtual painted in the background. Um, but um, again, fortunate as I was that Epic had a small um, uh, invitation group to come down and and play with the virtual studio early. So there was a group of us, uh, we went downtown uh, LA, and we were able to really look at the tools, understand the tools, and uh, interact with them, see what they're good, uh, see where their, uh, their fault lines are, and understand the possibilities as well as the limitations, which, you know, just kind of uh, feed me, someone like myself, um, to try and and move stuff there. And I'll get to that in a second. But mm. um, in creating one's environment, you're creating a 3D environment, say, using Unreal Engine. Um, and that could be uh, coupled with uh, inputting all kind of, of assets, call it structural assets, um, which you could match on stage, partially match on stage, um, and and uh, reasonably seamlessly in, um, interconnect them. Um, color is no longer an issue because you can literally sample the color from your set <laughs> and apply it to the render that's on your screens, and you don't have even a color uh, issue between the real and the and the unreal. Um, there's uh, the possibilities of how to match the the bottom of the screen where it hits the floor and there's curves and all kinds of things that you can do. But, you know, you still have to be a filmmaker and know how to avoid those things, uh, whether uh, right. how big your stage and, is is a v very important. And everyone story. listening to this, I suggest you, you just Google Mandalorian production and get... Uh, to see this uh, this this production thing because it's like it's a big stage in in, in a cylinder of uh, in in a cylinder shaped screen pretty much. Yeah, you have a ceiling piece. You have sides, yeah. uh, some curve um, on them. Uh, this year, I think they're going with much finer 
uh, screens. Uh, the directors love it because once the environments are input, they just show up on these screens and your foreground matches. It's a what it's a um, more of a what you see is what you get approach, right? Um, yes, more or less. Uh, you can do technical scouting with goggles, uh, which is pretty amazing, or with your iPad, um, and, and walk around and ascertain. I think the key for all of this is having a significant amount of time to do pre-production. So you really that, need to know so, what you're about to do. Right. So 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 how does that influence the entire process? Because um, a lot of these things would would have been shot in front of a green screen, and then you'd en enter this big chunk of time in the post-production where uh, VFX artists would replace the backgrounds and 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 match the motion and everything, and uh, and some of that talent will now move to the pre-production stage, right? Some of the people who would be yeah. making these environments would have to start early in the process and have the things ready. Um, and, and then th the, some of the work in the, in the later stages of the process would, would, well, would be different at least. Yeah, I don't think that particular notion is, is not uh, triggered or real. Uh, really kind of taken foot by this new virtual production uh -huh. and and uh, because pre-visualization has been with us now for several years it's already it's part of the process just not at this yeah. level of detail i guess it just also depends very much on what kind of show you're doing and when i say show i mean movie or or television uh -huh. what you're doing what your budget uh, constraints are and and how to manage that so you know, we obviously, you know, in the uh, early before times, we would just do a simple storyboard, um, often just penciled, uh, sometimes inked, and with uh, often some um, production uh, illustrations that were full color to show people the mood and feeling of that. I, I don't think that's changed very much, though we now move from those storyboards into a... Um, we, we could do it in SketchUp where we build a little kind of crude set where the camera can move around. Um, on the other hand, you can move it to very elaborate kind of pre-visualizations renders so that you can move around in your set virtually. But now you can actually apply that, um, that set to your actual stage. And um, so you but can before be, you do it, it can you, be in a virtual version of your sketch of your sketches, pretty much. Yes, and you can shoot, by the <laughs> way, in your if that's right, in your um, in your virtual uh, environment, and then even later they could add more photogrammetry, more texture, more aging. Uh, you know what I mean? It doesn't it, it it doesn't necessarily have to stop there. Right. There is still um, some green screen used, but it's generally you just take a small panel and and make it green behind the actor if you're going to have something oh, that is more so, rotoscoping. So, so that would be the virtual screen behind the actor becoming a green screen where, where needed. That that yeah, yeah that sure. is used as well. Not you know not nearly so much. Um, the other the other thing that that we see is that uh, on on the technical level. Um, sometimes when your environments are partially finished or have to be rendered out, say, at 2K uh, quickly uh, for some shooting, um, you'd want to do a, um, a you'd want to shoot some stuff uh, in green screen environments in order to re-render the background, say, in 6 or 8K or whatever right. you're, you're, you're using. Um, all of this allows the filmmaker some flexibility here. Um, I, I know that, you know, there has been um, uh, films that are restrictive budgets in very, very small environments that have used this very, very effectively, mainly with flying, so clouds and, and you know what I mean? It wasn't overly... Uh, complicated in, in terms of, of of the visual outside of the reality on stage, um, and the Mandalorian is a great example of of um, you know the kinds of work that you know you still have to measure how how far they get to walk, 
the the background needs to be slightly out of focus or you get a moiré. <laughs> Otherwise you uh, see the so, pixels, yeah. <sighs> yeah, the, so the, there are uh, issues to consider. I, 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 again, it was very interesting working with the screen and I, I'm not, you know, I'm the last one that's an expert here. You know, there are there are many who know so much more. I, I, I just dip my baby toe into this. And because I, I'm working with my own work in Unreal and have an understanding of that uh, effect on lighting the character, uh, the exciting thing is, you know, you have an environment uh, and you want to change from day to night as you change the light, you can literally drag the sun from yep. high to low or across the horizon. Uh, all the interconnected screens will effectively have that lighting. Um, often, cameramen will punch, uh, take one panel out, put a little light on to enhance, as long as it's obviously mm -hmm. out of frame. So all of these things are happening, um, and um, you know. On, on the personal uh, note, I've used this pandemic the last, you know, year and a half, 18 months, um, mainly to uh, be more focused on development of projects, uh -huh. uh, i.e. acquiring uh, book rights, scripts being assigned, written um, discussions and orders from studios to to move it, identifying budgets and so so we're into that process here and all in my little space <laughs> i'm about to start casting something from here and uh, you know that remote casting so, interesting that. exercise so, <laughs> yeah so everything needs an adjustment here on the other hand right. it's kind of nice to work from home um on the uh, you know on the on some of our projects, you know, we're we're going to be shooting on location and probably won't use anything like this. Uh, but on on a film that uh, that I wrote um, earlier um, or later last year, um, I have it in my head uh, basically to do this um, in virtual. Okay. Uh, a lot of it. It's a very contained piece, and I'll explain why in a sec. But it's a contained piece. Um, uh, basically, it takes place over a single night. Um, so it starts at kind of midday into dusk, and it goes the whole night and ends at dawn. Um, and so just the interactivity of light changings from inside to outside is obvious and, and good. But there's entire rooftop scenes, and it's, it's uh, near a desert. So I can literally build the landscape surround the rooftop set with that and and you're and, really good in unreal engine i mean the the things uh, i've seen of you your art uh, some of the virtual photography that you've done is yeah i'm not saying that i'm good at it i i have an understanding of it I'm, oh you, you know your way around uh, for sure i mean yeah you know i'm like uh, i'm like i have my my learner's permit <laughs> i'm able to drive around <laughs> town but i really have to check the speed and the windows like it doesn't come as natural uh to me as it would to a 21 year old kid who just like wow. but um but it's something that i'm extremely uh enamored with it's it's a, a fantastic tool and now they've added something called metahumans oh i've seen i've seen some of that yes yeah, in fact, I've I have an invitation to use it. I got oh, my invitation from God. Epic, so I haven't I haven't I haven't done it yet. But uh, are you I'm real? To, Am I looking at the real Jeremiah Chechik there, or are uh, you meta human? It's hard to know. It's hard to know now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the the um, the interesting thing about preparing this because there's a lot of um, people who are running in the shadows in this particular film across the street. So they're very uh, indistinct, shall we say. Um, and a perfect example of using synthetic uh, thespians, uh, you know, actors, metahumans, that kind of interactivity, and all and do as much on stage for wide, dynamic, powerful landscapes that are epic. I can I can use that as well. And then maybe, you know, go out to the desert and shoot for a week uh, with my team 
um, and and piece it together. So that that is the approach to the work. Um, again, the cost benefits are going to be you know interesting once you add up because you again you start with a storyboard. You're going to add, going into Maya perhaps and then to Unreal, and you really want to build in a way a complete animatic of your of your um certainly your action scenes or your interactive scenes so that when you get to the set you're not having these discussions about well how long is the shot what do we need what kind of tool is there you know does the camera have to move in can we do it on a fixed lens does it have you know all all of those things are done your crew knows it you know it your actors know it and so the efficiency of shooting so it, more it it doesn't it tough. doesn't it doesn't change the way in your in, in the way you produce as as in adding a ton of flexibility on the set to just change things you kind of have to dial it in a bit I, earlier um i think that that on the um certainly on the broad scale of doing any kind right. of right complicated action sequences yes i think you have to stay pretty close you can improvise all you want but the sure. cost then of time and well that didn't work <laughs> you it, know what i mean like it's interesting because 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 um when when i mean the, the good old days when everyone was shooting film you really had to save on the on the valuable celluloid and uh, cuz that's really expensive every minute is expensive so sure. there must have been a, a ton of planning and then when digital came along i think things changed a bit and a lot of experimentation came along and a lot of let's try this and then you end up with way too much footage and then um i have the feeling that some of that has been dialed back into a more structured process again The reason for that is is that uh, post production times have been generally right. up to this pandemic, which has thrown a you know a wrench in the in the wheel here. But 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 under normal you know circumstances, we used to have like 24 to 36 months, sometimes on a big big show, or 24 weeks, I yeah. should say, to to do a a major cut, 36. Now it's been cut to 16 and 12. <laughs> I mean, just compress, 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 so that you really, you know, I, I think that, you know, the filmmaking is such a, such a, a woven into the economics of that. Every story to be told um, is balanced by the amount of risk reward, which is uh, how much risk the financiers, whether they're indie or studio, feel that they want to risk in terms of marketing it out and getting their money back in a profit versus um, you know, what kind of spectacle the director wants to present. Uh, you know, you have an intimate movie like Nomadland, which last night won the Academy Award deservedly, I think. Um, which is a very intimate movie with, you know, no sets shot in a van and on location, beautifully rendered with an amazing story using real people, a few actors, and uh, and just a, a very powerful story message character that really touched people. Um, on the other hand, you can't really compare that to making Tenant. So mm -hmm. uh, where, where where everything is 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 kind of woven into the the mechanics of making it, you know, the visual style, etc. So in terms of balancing that, every filmmaker really has to understand that their appetite should be. Um, I, or I, I always say that the the risk should be more artistic than financial. Then you could be left alone by less nervous financiers. Um, <laughs> if your financial risk is greater than your artistic risk, then there's a, you'll you'll find that there are a lot of voices in your ears. Yeah. Um, what I like about the virtual filmmaking process, or I think I like like it, is laying out what the film will kind of be look like the editing the the, the kind of dynamic the tone uh, roughly and certainly the pace um it's more it's close closer to making an, an animated movie than it is a love action movie mm. in, in many ways but that really puts everybody in in a 
uh, mutual zone that allows everybody to row in the same direction. So I expect that we're going to see some really amazing, epic looking, you know, it may even be the kind of Lawrence of Arabia scope made in a basement. Will we, will that new way of working, will that change the way stories are approached? Will that benefit storytelling? I don't think that stories or storytelling has ever changed since the golden ass by Apuleius, you know, Aristotle. And the, the, the sense of, of, of uh, dramaturgy in storytelling remains consistent. It touches us on a human level and it's only the way we tell it that is different. All right. So I, don't, I don't think that changes. So once once you've uh, once you've started working with these tools, uh, then I'll definitely get you back. We'll up. do a follow up. I want yeah, to follow we'll up on that follow-up. one for sure. Yeah. Um, while we while we're talking about production, um, there's another thing that was I don't know from from my point of view briefly on the horizon, and then it kind of disappeared again. Um, I'm talking about Lytro. I'm talking about light fields. I'm talking about <laughs> cameras that will not only capture the, the the picture, but they will also capture the depth, which things that we have in our iPhones now, but on a very higher resolution, more professional level, which would which would then pretty much allow you to make productions, green screen type productions without the green screen. So you could shoot. Uh, an epic scene with your actors in a parking lot and replace the parking lot with a pyramid or something. I mean, just a, a big set, a virtual set uh, after yeah, the theoretically. Fact. Th theoretically, theoretically, that's my question. Cause, cause for, for the future of photography, we often shoot back and forth some emails with things we found and you send me something. Um, the, let me put this on the screen here. The <laughs> K lens, which is a German, product i guess and apparently they claim that they can do these kind of things with a camera so it's a lens that you put on your regular camera and and then that thing uh, apparently does something very akin to what the what the lytro system did which will allow you to um, yeah, to, to flip out the background or to change things in your photo based on depth so in this Example here, if anyone's watching the video, they're doing like uh, dynamic range processing based on the depth or uh, here background replacement in indoor guy being like a, a soccer player and then they put him on a virtual uh, soccer ground. So well, yeah. is, I, that, is that here? Can we do this now? Are you working with these things? Is that Hollywood or no, is it... I mean no, I think I think not yet. Anyway, I mean, I you know, in our our podcast, I, I've often when we talked about what would be the future of cameras, uh, I, I remember saying for me it would be a, a camera that records everything, not only the light that bounces uh, from a subject, um, the color, etc., uh, but also you know the depth and the texture and just all the information you can get out of a scene if that can be recorded with any kind of um, uh, acutance uh, so that you can process it and, and shift it, then ev everything be can become a layer, everything can become adjustable, and everything can be uh, duplicated or replaced. I think we're so early on this that, that a lens like that looks like an upgrade from your phone, maybe more information is, 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 is saved. Um, which would be good. They seem to be announcing they'll make it for multiple diff multiple cameras. Um, it's the kind of thing that you and I will probably try. Um, I, I don't I know. Don't, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't. I, I remember I don't have a friend of mine had the hopes for it, but I think yeah, I'll get the same here, same here. The hopes aren't that big because I remember trying the first Lytro, the like the lipstick shaped camera, which. Um, yeah, I have one of those. A, a friend of mine bought it, and I think he used it for an hour, and then it ended up yeah. on the shelf. Same. Um, same. And I, I played with it for 10 minutes, and after that, I was like, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> it's okay. Um, and then someone showed me the Lytro 2, which was a bit higher resolution, more 
regular camera shaped and that that didn't really add too much in terms of functionality more a bit more resolution but not really that much this one claims that it only right it, they, they take up resolution so this one claims that it will only half your existing resolution and i think you get like nine layers of depth and something like that so Again, so so what what you're telling me is that's not a thing that is being used on sets in Hollywood every day. No, I think you're you're finding uh, for companies. I'm, I'm guessing now. I don't know for a fact, but like company, there are many you know um, that sell polygonal assets. You know whether it's Adobe Substance mm. or I mean there there, there are markets uh, galore. Epic has one. Um, and, the these um, these companies uh, just employ people to go out with all kinds of recording devices um, and and shoot textures and mm -hmm. create textures um, and and then output them to the market and they either give them away as part of a bundle or they sell right. them individually and you can do, you can say oh you know I want. I want to buy a brick brick wall, an old brick wall from from me, and then and then you go like, oh, and I, I I want to paint a little or add a little water to that. I want to mix a little mud dripping off. You you can do all of that, but the original information needs to be texture, you know, things like uh, reflectivity, albedo. You know, there's a lot of terminology, spectral and depth if possible. Of, all of that, yeah. and and so the more this is another tool in that, and as these tools get um, uh, better in terms of quality, in other words, it may show you the the depth between, you know, the mortar and the actual brick, uh, whether it will show you the depth between, a, you know, a tiny tiny protrudence of a of a rock in there. We're not there yet, but but we're going to get there, and so the the spectral. You know, when light bounces off it, it will look shimmery and perfect if it's wet or dull, right. and you can adjust that. That's going to affect virtual production in a big way because, you know, you can just sure. say, you know, that background is a little bright. Why don't we throw some water on the wall so that it just kind of cools it down, but it gives us a little highlight here, and that's enough. We could just do that. Um, that'll be very exciting. I mean, you could do that now, but it just takes – a lot more labor and yes yes it's way more labor intensive and but then there will also be a level that is just good enough i mean there's there's diminishing yeah. returns from a certain point on so but we're not quite sure there yet. Hmm. no i mean it's like it's like editing a film for a release i mean at a certain right. point you gotta give it up and do the sound because it's got to be on the air or it's got to be in the theaters Right. But by the way, uh, I just remembered something about virtual production. Um, there's this uh, group of uh, VFX artists that have the, the YouTube channel called the Corridor Crew, who are in Los Angeles. Um, they're, they're a young company. They come from a gaming background and they have pretty much built up uh, and become a, a very... I wouldn't say low cost, but they are they are they they have they have shown in a few episodes what they do in virtual production um, compared to what Hollywood does. It, that's that's a shoestring budget they do that on, and they have they have used like off the shelf stuff. They have I think one sure. one uh, one uh, motion capture suit, so they can capture people waving their arms mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. Um, they built their own rig that uses an iPhone with uh, with an app to capture face. So you can capture the three dimensions of the face as it moves and, and feed that back into Unreal Engine and uh, and hook it up to a virtual character. And so so they, then they had this camera with a, with a, I think it was a VR tracker or something on it. So they would be able to move that around in a virtual environment um, and and see it on a screen. Um, and uh, and put this all together in the computer into a virtual production, which, again, from a budget point of view, was way lower than anything we've talked about so far here. But it yeah. it was it was amazing what you can exciting. do. It's amazing what I you can do, exciting. and I think I think that is a bit of a let's say a grassroots uh, movement here. Um, change coming from below and not from above in some circumstances. Yeah. 
Uh, certainly, the game. All of this really came out of the gaming industry. Yeah. I mean, that's where the action is. That's where the, that's where the the kind of dynamic. They just did a recent um, um, study of you know you know Gen Y and and asked them what is your preferred form of entertainment? <laughs> Television, is it movies, you know, for games. Games, Absolutely. Yeah. Twitch. Blew everything. Twitch. Streaming. Yeah, bl- yep, bl- yep, yep, yep. It just blew everything out of the water. And, and uh, between gaming and uh, cryptocurrency, that's the culture that is emerging uh, that I see anyway. Um, you know, and it is cultural. Which brings us to our last topic, crypto. <laughs> so um, here's the thing. I mean, I've dabbled in cryptocurrencies back when Bitcoin became big. I was like, oh, I need to know everything about that. And I learned a lot about it. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have enough of it. So <laughs> I, can't, I can't retire, unfortunately. But, um, but I kind of know what's going on behind that, the whole blockchain thing and, and how this works. And the thing that has been uh, big in the media for a while now is NFTs, non-fungible tokens, which, again, I mean, the, the simplest explanation is probably uh, a dollar is fungible, right? A dollar is a dollar, and it doesn't matter what the serial number on the dollar is; it is worth a dollar. And um, but but my car is 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 non fungible, right? It's one car, and if you have the it's hard to break in half and give. Half well, the not car even that, but if if I, if I have the the deeds that that or the title that gives me the car, that title is only val- val- only valid for one car, right? It's it's not That's for right. every and car. If I right? have a car, I have a car, and I want to give you a car, and you give me that car, their right. their values are different. Exactly. So so car, yeah. in the in the digital art scene um, that uh, has blown up, the 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 non fungible tokens have blown up as a means of well. Ah, the, uh, it, it, you've you've been you've been getting pretty deep into that topic. You spent well, a lot of time down I, that that rabbit hole. I have, I, and I'm still I, I'm trying to climb out of it, but, but I'm still uh, pretty much stuck in the mud there. But but um, I find it fascinating. I mean, what what I feel is that by buying a non fungible token is, is uh, on something, buying a piece of art really is is a way to emotionally connect with the story of the artist and how that story connects you to them or to a world that is um, in somehow informs who you are its representative uh, some people would wear a Rolex drive a Lamborghini wear a Brioni suit how you know etc why they're projecting a kind of value that they would like to expose to the world as it defines their character. You know, when you get to a, a different culture, which is a, a more youthful culture, they're not interested in Brioni suits and Rolex watches and Lamborghinis and all of that, that stuff. But to own a an NFT on on a Star Wars character or a virtual lightsaber or something like that connects them to the emotion they felt. And, and it is ownership of that. It's not the actual ownership of the sword because they don't really care about having a bunch of stuff in their small, unfortunately small apartments. But they, they still want to be collecting things that have cultural meaning to themselves. And, and I think the NFT art space is very much akin initially to collecting sports cards. I don't know if, if that was big in Germany, but when I was a kid, you know, people would trade bubblegum cards, is what oh, they yeah. were called, with but baseball and, you know. We have, soccer, we have those. Guess, we have Europe. those. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, you look at a, you know, Mickey Mantle 1965 baseball card which uh, doesn't that, have any intrinsic value it's not made of gold it's just, a piece it's, of cardboard. Not, it's just a bit of cardboard with a picture on it but but it may be worth a million dollars yes. because of it, it it's rare and it, it only you know, you know the, last. And the equivalent here in germany you know kinder eggs and sure. they have a they yeah, have a toy in them 
Yes, know and those. They have they have series Don't ask me of why, toys. But I know them. Yeah, but they they have series of toys in them. Like there there might be a dinosaur series or yeah, a Smurf right. a Smurf series or mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. um the, and those I'm not sure what it's like now, but maybe 20 years ago, I remember some of those little things becoming true collectibles. They are plastic. Sure. They're made in China. They are not intrinsically valuable, but the no. but they got assigned so much value by the people who collected them that they went on auctions for tens of thousands of of years. Sure. If you own that card, you're not you're you're basically not just throwing it on your desk. You're keeping it in a vault. Mm -hmm. The sense of it is that at one point you may pass it on, you may go to market and and sell it. Um, so that can that card, which you and I could just go online and go Mickey Mantle 1965. When we get a perfect image of that, we can actually make a print of it and stick it on our wall. Yeah, but we don't own it. Yeah, but if you own it, there's an emotional connection. It's a, it's a look what I have, and so. Uh, it's early days with the NFT world and, and, and art. But what I think um, we can't overlook is the influence of the blockchain on on work in general, whether it be contractual work, um, newer blockchains, which are being built now, one called uh, VeChain, uh, which is a video distribution blockchain, which will be very interested to I mean it is interesting already. I think you have the Netflix of the world and the um HBOs of the world really behind it because it's a decentralized way of moving your um video assets around the world uh easily. It's it, it exists in a blockchain. Uh of course there's going to be issues when somebody on that chain puts out a movie they don't or just steals a movie, puts it on there with no rights, and and the how do you take it down? And what are the big corporate backers going to say about that and how that works is going to be um, a problem of the future. A new, but, a, a new set of challenges happen. coming up for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, we don't really know where it's going, but we know it's coming. So and, I... Um, it, I I think with NFTs, we, I mean, we, we've seen an enormous hype about them. I think it's, it has died down a little bit uh, in the media. And mm. I, I have the suspicion it will probably follow a, a classical hype cycle. And I mean, there, there's just problems with it as well. We're talking about like energy usage sure. and these kind of things. So, um, yeah. but, but, but I think what that signifies is a cultural thing, a cultural change in some ways that uh, I think a lot of the a lot of people cannot understand just yet. I think it will take uh, quite a few more years for for some of these sure. things to sink in and become kind of normal. Yeah, um, th there's no question that uh, the blockchain writ large um, is undergoing tremendous shifts and changes, but we're we're really in the embryonic stage of it. We're not even in the first realm. This, these are early, early stages that people are discovering what the problems and advantages are and addressing them as it becomes more and more um, connected to our day-to-day -day life. I mean, as the internet did, you know, if you look at the internet in 1993, it was a way, or 1992, was a way, you know, if you wanted a research paper at a university, you had to put in a bunch of instructions on your computer, you know, on a dial-up. It would, you know, it would move through the internet, not the web, the internet to a university. You could oh, yes. then read a, a paper, all of that stuff. And um, I, personally, I was involved in that. I really liked that. I started a, <laughs> uh, a company not long ago. <laughs> another story. Um to move video through the internet, and my name is on a patent there, so I'm oh, there you know, you go. a little little footnote in history there. <laughs> but but um, but the, you know the actual uh, presentation of it was when uh, Mosaic, Mark Andreessen, I think wrote right. uh, Mosaic, and and I remember seeing it at a demonstration. It was really an electronic art show, and he was running mosaic on a computer which was on a pedestal and you could actually explore the hyperlinks at the time and it just blew my mind i thought 
oh my God, you don't have to put in any of this instructions. It's just automatic. There was only maybe yeah. three websites to go to, websites. Yeah. Um, but the possibilities um, I were had so that, endless. Yeah, I had that um, epiphany back back uh, at the time I worked for Hewlett Packard and I I, uh, I I converted our when I when I saw Mosaic and the NCSA web server, I set one up. I put our service catalog, our internal service catalog, which was a print pamphlet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I I got the source file. I converted it to HTML. I put it on the server. I showed it to my boss, expecting him to like understand what that means. Like no print He's anymore. Like, people doing? people We're can just order online. <laughs> exactly. That's what he said. I did it. I did it off hours. But he um, he said and what. To be what do what what does What's that the purpose of them exactly, and I think a, a, a month later I was working for a different department because I couldn't. I, it, it was just impossible yeah. to yeah. be surrounded Chris, by so on. Ah, yeah, the failure of imagination. Yes, is, totally. Is something that's unforgivable. Uh, you know, and and by the way, uh, we can blame ourselves because we. I mean, I was you know all, all there at the the beginning, waving the flag on on the internet and how it was going to change the future for good and and, and be the great equalizer. And, <laughs> not boy, not just know, quite a good sort of development, right? <laughs> the law of unintended consequences. <laughs> now we are in our own bubbles. We have our own truths. So we are more partisan than ever globally. And oh and, wow. You know, on the other hand, we are able to reach out like this to each other and, and have a discussion. So everything comes with uh, the unintended consequences as well as the directions we set out to, to you know, to live in. And I always equate it to, okay, you, you chart a course, you're on your little um, sailboat, you're charting a course across the ocean, and here it is to get to the Canary Islands, blah, blah, blah. If you're off by one degree, in yeah. your chart. Oh, I, I, and you said sell for 7,000 miles? And here's, 10, here's, miles away. here's a very good example. I remember distinctly back in the 80s, um, I think the compact disc had just come out, things were going digital. And I had this vision of, uh, of music distribution on memory cards, like a solid state similar to an SD card kind of thing. That was mm -hmm. my vision. I had this in my mind and I was, I, I thought that everyone would use these kind of things to, to <laughs> get rid of the, of that circular motion of that rotation, yeah. you know, and uh, have solid state music. The thing I did not envision was the internet, right? So it, it was, it, that has completely done away with exactly that. Yeah, I was just going to show you, which is just hooked on to a little while. I don't want to take the time to get it off. But it is a golden thumb drive with uh, Marley's Exodus on it. There you it, go. It, to wear around your neck. Yeah. And it has the, you know, the original, like, beautifully. Uh, you know, the listen, I I think like you, we embrace the future and, and new technologies. We, we want to use them partially. I think we're just interested in technology as a creative force in and of itself, sure. like because it's there. Sure. Like, uh, show me a new device or a new technique or a new, you know, I will be all over it. I, I want to see what it provokes in myself. You know what I mean? Like, I, you know, I have a, a, a cousin who's worked uh, effectively in the art world very successfully using, um, um, you know, a, a, Google Maps, you oh, know, okay. you know, traveling around the world and, and finding images and, you know, appropriating them and uh, moving them into his kind of uh, world. And but, you know, it, I, I love that. I mean, there's Google Maps used for creative for, 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 you know, for travel and especially during the pandemic, people are doing that. Hey, you could you could do tours, oh, yeah. <laughs> do photo tours in in. in you know, it takes Cert people along. Certainly possible. And Certainly possible. Very, yeah. And and yes. Uh, so all of these things provoke things that are both kind of the the intended direction of the technology, and yet they they often provoke the unintended. Uh, virtual production to circle back, I think, was not developed as virtual production. 
it, it was developed as a way to kind of put polygons together to create realistic environments for gaming. Right. But as LED screens became sharper, and the application of, say, After Effects on a big screen in a concert, we were, you know, people would think, well, why can't I, I put my environment there? And what kind of reflectivity it would give on the actor and how can we use it? So that becomes more and more of a process. And then they develop a little kind of studio module so that you can move things and interact and, 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 and you know, uh, change backgrounds and all of that stuff. And then how do you integrate that with constructed sets in the foreground? So all of these things come out of a dream. All right, Jeremiah, thank you so much for spending time with me. I know you're quite busy, so I really appreciate that. Um, if people want to see some of your work, can I send them to chechik.com? Is that the right place? You can send them because I can't prevent them from going there. There, this is what it looks like. So there's your, your art, there's your photography on there. What we see here is a, is a slideshow of... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to tell... These are samples of okay. what I have on my site. Absolutely. And, um, you know, what can I say? Those are they're fun. And then here's one that is more in the um, generative art that I have been playing with now. Awesome. This is a combination of generative and what looks like an aerial shot of mountains. What looks um, like. That's, would, the, that's the important part, what looks like. <laughs> Though it is, it is shot very close to a, a rock on a sandy beach. Yeah. All right, Jeremiah, thank you there so you much go. for your time. Um, You're very welcome. I want to have you back as soon as you had uh, more more actual production with the virtual stuff. Um, It'd be my pleasure. Really looking and, forward uh, to that. We'll, we will see you at the end of the week. And uh, see you see you on uh, the future photography. Until then, take care. Bye-bye. Bye all. Thanks. Bye.